Hey everybody, I have a video here for you today, and this will probably be my last video or one of my last videos on the Shroud. I think I have talked enough about it, and I want to move on to other subjects. And frankly, I feel a little weird talking about it, but it's an amazing story. It's one of the craziest things I've ever researched, and it led me down uh, paths that I never expected to go down. But what you are looking at is an artist rendition of the image of Edessa arriving to King Agbar. And church historian Eusebius writes that Jesus sent the image of him on a cloth and it converted King Agbar to Christianity and cured him of leprosy. And everybody who investigates that story thinks it's totally made up by Eusebius just to fit into the biblical narrative of this miraculous Jesus character. But actually what I think is the image on the shroud, uh, he was part of the royal family of Edessa. And that's why this image was sent back to him. And I just think this is just a crazy story that has just been lost to history. I believe the Shroud was the original catalyst for the Christian religion. Christians were first called Christians in Antioch, and that definitely refers to uh, Edessa, Turkey. There are many cities of Antioch, Antiochus in Turkey, but everything that was happening in the Christian movement was going on in Edessa. So I think that it could be the true origin of the Shroud. It was a family member of the royal family in Edessa, and the church just does not want that history to come out, obviously. And I think that it was the great secret of the Shroud and why the Shroud hasn't been embraced by the church, even though it would be the greatest proof, proof of the resurrection story. And I just think this is amazing how this whole story got lost to time. Edessa, Turkey was eventually centuries later run over by uh, the Muslims and their story from their city gets erased. The church tries to erase the story. Unbelievers just have no, just won't for an instant believe in any historical facts on the shroud and the whole history just gets lost to time. And I'm just trying to uh, pull out some lost history, but the image stays in Odessa, Turkey originally for about 900 years. Uh, Muslim armies come in centuries after it first arrives, and maybe the history is kind of lost. But it goes to Constantinople in 944, and that's where I want to start talking about the history of the last thousand years of the Shroud and the Knights Templar, and that's where it really gets good. But uh, I just want to talk about it going to Constantinople first. Now I just want to read you some accounts of what happens in 943 and 944. These are very important years in the history of the Shroud. It says 943, and I will leave all these links below. It says, in 943, a large army sent by the Byzantine Emperor Romanus arrives at the walls of Edessa, then still under Arab Muslim control. The Byzantine general promises to leave Edessa untouched, to pay a large sum of money, and to release 200 high-ranking Muslim prisoners, all in return for the surrender of the Jesus-imprinted cloth. And it says, uh, much against the wishes of Edessa's citizens, the cloth is taken off to Constantinople. And then on the 15th of August, 944, it says, after a long land journey across the breadth of what is today Turkey, the Jesus imprinted cloth of Edessa is received, is received in Constantinople amid great celebrations. It is accorded its own feast day, the 16th of August, and that day is celebrated for centuries. It says, because of the awe in which the cloth is regarded in either Eastern Orthodox thought, there are no public showings, only privileged private showings. The cloth is installed at the Pharaoh's Chapel of Constantinople's Imperial Palace, the repository of most sacred relics of Jesus. And on this website, it says, in 944, a Byzantine army besieged Muslim-occupied Edessa. The Christian general offered the city's Muslim emir a huge sum of money, the freeing of 200 Muslim captives, and the promise of perpetual immunity for just one thing, the Mandilian, or what we know today as the Shroud of Turn. After considerable haggling, the emir agreed to do so, and the Mandilian was taken off to Constantinople, where it remained for two and a half centuries as the most sacred ob object in the imperial collection of relics. And I just want to read here. It says, The shroud was then brought to Constantinople, the capital city of Byzantium, on the 15th of August, 944, for the purpose of obtaining a new and powerful source of divine protection. The shroud's arrival was celebrated with processions, and it was placed in the Pharaoh's chapel, the imperial treasury for relics, located in the palace of the emperor. There are several surviving eyewitness accounts of that day. 
and it says that Gregory Referendarius, Archdeacon of the Hagia Sophia in Constantinople, was a member of the clerical committee that arranged for the reception of the shroud, and in a sermon dated the 16th of August, 944, he mentioned that it was a full-length image of Christ and carried his bloodstains. Thereafter, the shroud was regular, regularly shown in the city as described below, and that is very important, the image of Edessa, is described on its arrival in Constantinople not as just the image of the face of Jesus, but as a full-length image of Christ carrying his bloodstains, and that is proof that what came to Constantinople in 944 is what we know today as the Shroud of Turin. Now the Shroud was kept in Constantinople for about 250 years, and it was kept under the utmost secrecy, but uh, later in the last part of its run in Constantinople, they became a little more lax with the secrecy, and I believe it cost them. And it says here in 1201, uh, Nicholas Mesorides, and he is an important member of the Nicene Empire and church historian, he says this about the shroud and the church it is kept in. It says, in this temple, Christ rises again, and the shroud with the burial linens are clear proof. The burial lines of Christ, these are of linen, of cheap and easily obtainable material, still smelling fragrant of myrrh to find decay because they wrap the mysterious naked dead body after the Passion. And what he's clearly describing there is what we know today as the Shroud of Turin. And three years later, and that would have been 1204, the Shroud had been moved to another imperial church, Our Lady of Blachernay. During the first entry into Constantinople as guest of the young emperor, the crusaders were overcome with admiration and envy at the spectacle of treasures and relic and the likes of which they had never seen. Robert de Clary, the chronicler of the fourth crusade, was particularly interested in the shroud. He writes, and among these others, there was another of the monasteries, which was called Our Lady St. Mary of Blachernay, where was the shroud in which our Lord was wrapped which was stretched straight up every Friday so that one could well see on it the figure of our Lord. And he was clearly seeing a ceremony held every Friday in the early 1200s in Constantinople. And I just want to go over to this little snippet from a book written by Ian Wilson, and I will leave all these links below. It said, and this clause identification with the former image of Edessa also makes sense of the fact that Robert tells us that the viewing occurred at the Church of the Virgin Mary at Blachernay. We already know that the image of Edessa and the Sindon, irrespective of whether or not they were or were not one and the same object, were normally kept at the Pharaoh's Chapel of the Great Palace. But as we noted earlier, in the instance of drought in the time of Emperor Michael IV, whenever Constantinople felt itself to be in some danger, the custom was to carry the image in procession from the Great Palace to Blachernay to invoke its legendary powers of protection. There can be little doubt that this was what Robert de Clary so uniquely witnessed, a very special showing of the cloth itself, not just inside its casket, or Ark, as I showed you in the video a couple videos ago, where they held the burial shroud in this Ark, and that was the new Ark of the Covenant to them. It had the powers of God, in their opinion. It was to persuade Constantinople citizens that they had nothing to fear from the rough crusaders in their midst, that Christ and the Virgin Mary were on their side protecting them just as they always had throughout their similar dangers during Constantinople's long history. And it's clear that Robert de Clary, a member of the Crusaders, uh, saw the shroud, witnessed the shroud in the ceremony, and alerted the more important people that uh, gave the Crusaders their order that indeed the burial linen of Christ. Now a little later in 1204, once the Crusaders had knowledge that the burial shroud was in Constantinople, they launched the Fourth Crusade with the sole purpose of getting the shroud. And it says here, and it, there are descriptions of a bloody three-day battle for the shroud in 1204, but on this website here, it says in 1204, during the Fourth Crusade, Constantinople was sacked by the treasure-hungry Crusaders. Among these were the Knights Templar who ransacked the Pharaoh's chapel. The following year, in 1205, Theodorus Angelos wrote to Pope Innocent III, 
the Venetians partitioned the treasures of gold, silver, and ivory, while the French did the same with the relics of the saints, and most sacred of all, the linen in which our Lord Jesus Christ was wrapped after his death and before the resurrection. We know that the sacred objects are preserved by the predators in Venice and France and in other places, the sacred linen in Athens. And the reason why the shroud was taken to Athens is because the leader of the Fourth Crusade, his name was Othon de la Roche, uh, he grabbed it and took it back to his hometown. At least that is the history of the shroud in Europe at the very beginning. It says here on this website, the Templar Othon de la Roche was known as the Lord of Athens. It is almost certain the Mendelian, and that is just another name for the image of Edessa or the shroud, was in his possession in Athens in 1204. Sometime later, it made its way to the south of France, a movement which, when, which can be discerned by the following clues found in the earliest writers of the Grail story, all of whom, by the way, were connected in some way to the Templars. Robert de Boron tells us that the secret Grail, the secret of the Grail, was taken to the Vales of Averon. And that is another way it gets confused with Britain. In a previous video, I told you how the Bertio Edessonorum was confused with a place in Britain when it was actually in Edessa, Turkey. And it says here, the writing of Averon, it says, we can now see how later poets presumed Averon was actually Avalon in Glastonbury. Now, after the fourth crusader general, Othon de la Roche, the Templar, had the shroud in Athens for a few years. It was given to King Louis IX of France, and he has this built. This is the Sainte Chapelle of France, a famous cathedral that is built with one specific purpose, to house the holy relics of Christ. And it is said that King Louis IX spent more on the holy relics than he did uh, the cost of building this cathedral. And in the treasury of that church, in the mid 13th century listed in its treasury is the Mandilian or the burial shroud of Christ and it was kept in this shrine and I can't help but think of the Da Vinci Code when Robert Langdon says the grail lies under the rose and in Paris France back in the mid 13th century the most famous rose was the famous rose glass stained window with the Chant Chapelle and under it lay the holy grail what we know today as the shroud of Turin now the Templars came into permanent possession of the Shroud in the late 13th century and maybe around 1250 or so. But on this website it says the Knights Templar were aware of the significance of religious relics and were partially responsible for the first 13th century trade in these items. Perhaps the most significant factor was the rumor that throughout Europe at the preceptory meetings the Templars worshipped a mysterious bearded male head called Baphomet. Described in some accounts as a plaque and by the more malicious as an idol, the word plaque would suggest a flat rather than three-dimensional object. And that's exactly what it was. It was simply the shroud had turned, folded up, so just the head was showing. And all this stuff about the goat and the devil and this evil image that the Templars worshipped were all made up by King Philip, who owed the Templars a heck of a lot of money and knew that they held in their position a great secret against the church, the shroud, and maybe who that shroud really represented. And maybe it wasn't the biblical Jesus. But uh, I believe Baphomet is clearly the Shroud of Turin. And when you put in uh, the word Baphomet in what is called the Atbash cipher, which the Templars definitely knew about, the word Sophia comes out, Greek for wisdom. And I think that's excellent uh, research by people who have brought that forward. And I just can't help think of the Da Vinci Code and all those ciphers and that talk in that movie. But... The Atbash cipher, Sophia, wisdom, that, that had to have been a great wisdom that the Templars held against the church, having the shroud, but they haven't brought it back far enough. Sophia, if you remember, the Hagia Sophia was the name of the citadel where the original shroud ceremonies took place in, in Turkey. Hagia Sophia is Greek for holy wisdom. Baphomet, when you put it into the app bash cipher, it spits out Sophia. I can't help think that there's a connection between Sophia and the Hajj of Sophia, where the original shroud ceremony took place. And over here, it says, Dr. Bar Barbara Frail, who investigating v Vatican archives, 
unearth a 1287 description of a Templar ceremony by Arnaud Sabatier, conducted somewhere in the south of France with only a few witnesses in attendance. Arnaud was shown a long piece of linen supporting a bearded man and was asked to kiss its feet. Afterwards, they conducted a mass with a bearded male head. And if he's kissing the feet on this linen image that had a bearded man, this is obviously the Shroud of Turin, and Barbara Frail unlocked that uh, testimony in Vart Vatican Archives, and that definitely refers to the Shroud of Turin in the Knights Templar. And this here, this is just the artist's rendition of the original Grail ceremony. This is the Ark that I talked about that held the Shroud of Turin being carried in here. This is what that represents. Now by 1307, the Templars were extremely wealthy. They possibly had a great secret against the church and the Shroud. And they also uh, were owed a heck of a lot of money by King Philip. So King Philip put all these lies out about the Templars and made up all this, uh, you know, devil worshiping stuff and he put out an edict on friday the 13th 1307 that all the templars were to be arrested and it finally concluded on the 14th of march 1314 when the last two dignitaries were burned at the stake on an island in the seine by king philip and his cohorts and they proclaimed their innocence of heresy with which they had been charged to the end one was a grand master of the order jocks jocks de Molay, and his companion in death was the master of Normandy, Geoffrey de Charnay. Now, when the king and his men were rounding up the Templars, it was clear that they were looking for one specific thing. They were looking for the shroud. They ransacked everywhere where the Templars were staying, but they never found it. The shroud was skirted away by escaping Templar members, and it doesn't resurface till the middle of the 15th century. And it resurfaces with a Jean de Verge, who was a great, great, granddaughter of Othon de la Roche, who originally led the Fourth Crusade into Constantinople. And she married a man by the name of Geoffrey de Charnay, a relative of the last Templar burned at the stake. And this is where the shroud begins to appear in Lyre, France, really the first historical documentation of the shroud being shown. And it says, after the death of Jean Verger de Verge and her son Geoffrey II, the Shroud came into the possession of her granddaughter, Margaret de Charnay. She allowed the cloth to be publicly viewed on occasions during the period of 1400 to 1453. In 1454, she sold the Shroud to Duke Louis of Savoy and received from him the castle of Verambone and the revenues of the estate of Mirabel near Lyon for valuable services to him. And that's how the Shroud eventually became uh, uh, housed in Turin, Italy. That is historical documentation from Odessa, Turkey, all the way to where it sits today. So I just hope you enjoyed some of that history of the Templars and the Shroud. And I just can't help think of the Templars' name, the Poor Knights of Christ, the Essenes, this original messianic revolutionary movement against Rome in the first century around Jerusalem. They were known as the Poor One in many ancient texts. So I think the Shroud connects the Templars and the Essenes and the name they choose is a perfect example of that. Here is that church in Paris, Knight Templar imagery, Shroud imagery, and the Shroud once laid under the rose, just as in Grail Legends, and in the middle of that rose is an image of Christ with a sword in his mouth, and I can't help think of the Essenes again. And once again, back to the very beginning of the story, the image of Edessa arrives to King Agbar. And who is King Agbar's wife? Well, I've shown you in previous videos, she is Queen Helena of Adiabeni, and Adiabeni is just uh, hiding Edessa. It's another name for Edessa, just because the historians don't want you to know where this history comes from. And where is Queen Helena? Where is her sarcophagus? It is in the Louvre in Paris, France, and I can't think can't help but think of Tom Hanks kneeling down like a Knights Templar at the Louvre. Queen Helena, her sarcophagus is at the Louvre. Is that just a coincidence? Maybe I'm starting to think too much. Or maybe Dan Brown knew the real history and just encoded into the, to the movie. And the movie was just a mystery on what the true Holy Grail was. I brought out many coincidences in this video. Hope you thought this was interesting. You have a nice day.